So nearby Lucas, who's your favourite member of Marvel's first family? Uh, that's the one with like Angel and Beastman in it, right? Yeah. Beastman, Beast. Beast. Someone's going to get mad about that either <laughs> way. <laughs> It's a fairly well-known fact in nerdy circles that in 1994, a small production company made a Fantastic Four movie they never planned to release, purely to hold on to the rights for the Fantastic Four and stop them reverting back to Marvel. What's lesser known, though, is that the actors who appeared in that movie didn't know about that and apparently spent a year trying to get the movie released after it was shelved. And that's just bad. <laughs> so, Lucas, are you aware of this story, first of all? So, I'm aware of like the generic story around the fact that like Marvel sold off a lot of the rights. Yes, so we should cover that first. And so what do you know about Marvel selling the rights to all their characters around the 80s and the 90s? Yeah, so I believe Marvel were like, you know, in the shit to put yes. it lightly. So uh, 1980s, 1990s, Marvel were not doing well financially and they saw an opportunity to make a bit of money by selling the rights to their characters for TV and uh, film. And that resulted in them selling off nearly every character they owned, including the Fantastic Four. We won't get into that, the full details of the deals that were signed by Marvel here, but suffice to say, they were all-encompassing. And in regards to the deal they signed, with a, I've got his name here, a big dicked German filmmaker, called Bernd Eichinger, um, he convinced Stan Lee himself to sign over the rights to the Fantastic Four and the Silver Surfer. But here's the rub. He didn't just get the rights to the Fantastic Four, the characters, he got the rights to the comic books. And as a result, anything introduced in a Fantastic Four comic book was fair game to be made into a movie. Right. Which included basically all of Cosmic Marvel. And you might recall a few years ago when they were trying to make Guardians of the Galaxy 2, this bit Marvel in the arse, because they wanted to put Ego the Living Planet into Guardians of the Galaxy 2, but that was technically owned by Fox still, because they still had the rights to the Fantastic Four and everything introduced therein. So they had to change Ego, and that's why he's not like just the giant planet man. Well, actually, no. What they did is they had to give away a character to Fox, um, and that character became Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Oh. So Negasonic right, Teenage okay. Warhead is a character that was originally owned by Marvel, the, like the movie studio, mm. and they swapped it to Fox in return for Ego the Living Planet. It's weird, because like Ego's the bigger name and bigger character. And, and you're right there, Lucas, like, you know, Ego is technically and literally the bigger character, but like, it's just that Marvel weren't planning on anything doing Negasonic like Teenage Warhead, and uh, Fox weren't planning on doing anything with Ego the Living Planet, so they just swapped them over. It seems weird that that's how e they planned Ego out then. Like, I, Kurt Russell was great, but I, st I still was a bit iffy on elements of Guardians too. Yeah, Ego true. being one of them. One of the things I like about the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, though, is like how good the performance, and I, I, I hate that I can't pronounce her name, like Ponkletoff, I think it is, Ponkletoff, uh, who played Mantis, Mantis yeah. because I did not know she wasn't in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie, because her performance in the second one and the subsequent movies in which she was is so strong, I always assumed she was part of the core Guardians cast. She fills it. Huh? Yeah, and I rewatched the first one recently, and I was like, when does Mantis turn up? She feels like she should be in these scenes because Mantis is part of the Guardians. Mm. Um, as mentioned, like Bernd Eichinger managed to approach Stan Lee and get the rights to basically everything that had ever appeared in any Fantastic Four comic book. And the, one of the details we saw that's kind of amazing is that he actually had to go back and secure that deal um, after a year or so because it turns out that Stan Lee couldn't sign over the rights to the entirety of the Fantastic Four because Marvel had inexplicably sold the rights to just Johnny Storm to Universal, I think, for a planned TV show about the Human Torch on his own that never went anywhere. Oh. I think that moment, anything sums up how desperate Marvel was to make money. They were willing to sell like individual characters. As far as I'm aware, they went for pennies. Relatively, yes. Like, like obviously, it, I think it was like tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. But thinking about what that is now and how much they're buying those rights back for yeah. or trying to, yeah. While the exact terms of the deal I think are signed with Marvel and Stanley are not known, one of the pertinent pieces of information you're probably aware of is that as long as Fox continues to do something, anything with the brand, the terms of the deal would refresh. And uh, the commonly touted number is every seven years. So every seven years, Fox had to do something, anything, with the rights to the Fantastic Four. And what happened is like, Ikinga had those rights and then his production company got bought out by Fox and obviously the rights reverted to Fox, who then realized, wow, we own the Fantastic Four this is great, we should probably do something with this. And the problem is that Eichinger's idea for a Fantastic Four movie would cost too much money. Like, he basically pitched Endgame 
in the 90s. <laughs> and like his proposed film would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars, which doesn't sound that weird for a superhero movie now. But imagine back in the 90s, pitching a several hundred million dollar special effects extravaganza starring four characters that were so unheard of, Marvel sold them for the equivalent of pennies. And even though Fox didn't want to make like the several hundred million dollar blockbuster extravaganza that Eichinger did, they did want to hold on to those rights because they thought in a couple of years time, when the technology progresses enough to make special effects cheaper, we could do something with this. But we have to do something now to ensure we hold on to the rights because that's around the time that you had like Tim Burton's Batman movie coming out. Right. Yeah. So imagine like, you know, Tim Burton Batman comes out and like all these studios like, wow, comic book movies, comic book characters, that's big business. What do we own? And a bunch of companies realized they owned a shit ton of stuff from Marvel. That's when Marvel started <laughs> to scramble to get it all back. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't because other companies had done it. Because everyone just see Batman be successful. Yeah. So. And it made like hundreds of millions of dollars. So Fox knew that they could make money doing it, but they couldn't make money with the idea that they had. So like, Not currently they, make money. Yeah. What they decided to do instead was make a Fantastic Four movie for $1 million. Oh. Which is not a lot of money no, in, when you're making a superhero blockbuster. To help make this $1 million superhero movie, they contacted B-movie auteur Roger Corman. And he's like, if you've not heard his name, you've heard his fucking name. Like, Roger Corman is responsible for some of the most just like bottom of the barrel um, uh, B-movies you've seen. Like, he made all the rip-offs of all the popular movies, but he's very successful at doing so. I mean, it's scoping, sensibly. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, that's the thing. Roger Corman does not make good movies, but he does make profitable ones. Yes. And he's a very competent director and filmmaker when it comes to B-movies specifically. And the problem is, is that no one told Roger Corman or the cast of the movie that this movie was never going to see the light of day. And exactly when that decision was made is unclear. Um, with some sources saying that the movie was never intended to see the light of day ever, and others saying that it was only like halfway into production they realized how poor the quality was, that they had to shelve it so they wouldn't damage the brand. If they wanted to keep the rights, surely they had to release the product, not just quietly make the movie no, behind the scenes. That's, that's when we go back to the terms of the deal they signed, which were so loose and open to interpretation, they didn't really need to release the movie, they just had to make it. And one of the things that I think sums this up is that um, there's a reported conversation between Roger Corman and Eichinger about like, you know, the fact that, oh, we lose the rights in like a month. Mm -hmm. When should we start making the movie? And Eichinger said, well, we should you know, start making it a couple of weeks before so that Marvel don't think we're doing it just to hold on to the rights. And Roger Corman's like, well, it doesn't fucking matter if we make it a month before or a day before. Yeah. They're going to know we're doing that. So they made, they started filming the movie like the day before it happened. <laughs> like we're not exactly who made the decision to try and shelve the movie is not clear, but what we do know is that Roger Corman and all of the actors were ghosted by Eichinger, the second production wrapped. And they could not get a hold of me, ghosted them for an entire year. And this is where the story gets kind of like depressing for the actors. Did they get paid? They got paid, but they wanted the movie to get made. I think, I, you know, they were, I, and that's thing, I don't recall the names of any actors that will be listed below, but they were seeing stuff like, you know, the success of Batman. Mm -hmm. Imagine like being a working actor, it's like, yeah. superhero movies are all the rage, you get to beat Marvel's first family, and the amount of effort they put in was actually insane. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, like the costume designer, like made the costumes look exactly like they did in the original comics. Mm -hmm. And the actors that played The Thing and Benjamin Grimm respectively, spent hours working together um, so that they would be able to more, better emulate each other's gait, so that it'd be more believable that they were the same character. So they had two actors playing yeah. in two roles. Just, yeah. you know, just little things like that. Ben. What? Uh, what do you guys look... And then when the, they found out, oh, the film's not getting finished, the actors scraped together thousands of their own dollars to complete the soundtrack. Oh, no. And they got their costumes out of storage. They somehow managed to keep them, and they went to, like, Comic-Con in costume to promote the movie. Roger Corman, bless him, um, cut together a trailer and put it on, um, uh, like, the extras of, I think it's Carnosaur 2. They did photo spreads for, like, Nerd Interest magazines and stuff like that. The editors, like, worked on their own time to try and finish the movie, so it no. wasn't finished. <laughs> And they finally, finally scraped together a work print of the movie and tried to screen it. And do you want to guess what happened? I'm guessing like Fox stepped in and shut it down. Not Fox Lucas. Probably the biggest enemy 
of comic book movies in existence right now. And just from that descriptor, can you guess what man it is? Martin Scorsese. <laughs> <laughs> no, but think, who is the enemy of good comic book movies? I mean, there's a few. I, I would joke Zack Snyder, but Avi Arad, maybe? Avi Arad, yeah. yes. Avi Arad killed this movie in the crib, and the story goes that he heard about this Fantastic Four movie being made, and he was like, what? And he reportedly got an early look at a work print somehow, mm. didn't like it, approached Eichinger, who still owned the rights, you know, he's, you know, he still owns the rights movie, bought the movie from Eichinger for several million dollars, uh, making it profitable on paper, and then according to him, burned every single one. And do you know how the actors found out about this? Two or three days before the premiere, um, someone in a suit came in and took all the prints they had. Oh no. And like, that's the worst thing, because, you know, this was a little bit more in the future. That could have been like, well, we've got like a digital copy saved and we well, can just like leak this. it onto the internet. But like, some prints did survive. And you can watch it on the internet right now. The entire film is on YouTube. Not in great quality, but it's in the entire thing's there. There'll be clips of it dotted throughout this very piece. So it did manage to survive. But there'll be lessons for everyone out there. And never try. We are the Fantastic Four. So I guess we have to mention as well, spoilers for Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, you had your chance. Do not scroll down to the comments, people will know that we're talking about it. What do you think of um, uh, Jim from The Office now being uh, Mr. Fantastic? Because that's been fan casting for years, hasn't it? It has been fan casting for years, and I'm, I'm glad that they put it in. I'm kind of like... I did giggle when I saw that because I watched it in the cinema and as soon as he... When he was like, and here we have Reed Richards and it was just... I just went... The fact they've done it. Yeah. The balls to have done it. And that's my favourite bit as well. He, he gets immediately killed off which means he's never coming back. But it kind of would be weird if he is... Like if they bring Reed Richards in and he isn't because every other character is the from the multiverse yeah. is the same actor. They all look the same, yeah. Um, so it will be a bit weird if like, no, no, that was a different Reed Richards man. It's like, all right, I'm glad they put him in and I'm glad they killed him off because that scene was great. Yeah, and we have to give big props to just like they drag Patrick Stewart's skeleton out. <laughs> oh, God. And they put him in the fucking little bubble car. And the fa and do you know what was most impressive about that scene? The fact they play the original X-Men 90s cartoon riff. You hear his voice and then you hear... Da -da 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 -da. And if people don't know why that... Is surprising. Like, it turns out that riff was like ripped off in part from like a sitcom from Hungary or something like that. Some weird like foreign project no one's likely ever heard of. And there was a huge rights issue with it, and that's why we never had it in the Fox movies, because they could never mm. secure the rights to it because it was like, you know, in limbo. So the fact that like Disney were able to walk in with their like no fucking legal of course with, Disney were. Yeah, so the fact that Disney were able to like swagger in with a like billion dollar legal shotgun, like fucking put it in. Mickey Mouse just came in with a blank <laughs> check, like what the fuck do you need? How much do we need to put that theme in? So the fact that we never had that riff in what, like 12 of those X-Men movies, mm -hmm. the, f they, the fact they never put it in and they never have um, Xavier say, to me, my X-Men. Something you mentioned before we started recording that made me giggle is there's like three of the smartest people in the entire universe in that room. And they attack Scarlet Witch with their hands. Yeah, just Reed Richards, smartest man in the universe, just reaches out slowly. <laughs> she just cut, literally cuts into ribbons. It's like, if you're that clever, you should have known that she was a threat. Come that's, on. That's what made that bit so, like, frustrating and hilarious to me, of, like, Doctor Strange, you're the biggest threat. It's like, well, if I'm the biggest threat, and I'm scared of Scarlet Witch, that means she's a fucking threat as well. And they're like, oh no, but you're the one who's going to travel the multiverse. Like, that's that's a literal plan. Yeah, also, I'm running through the multiverse to get away from her. She's coming. If you want to see me and Lucas talk more shit about Marvel movies, just so you know, just shooting the shit about stuff we enjoy, you can do so on the Untitled Side channel. There will no doubt be many a video of us just um, uh, shooting the shit about stuff we enjoy. Maybe we'll record a... Fat Fiend unfocused. Maybe that's today. the thing. Like, the, I like the concept of the Fat Fiend unfocused, of just like an unfocused conversation about a particular topic. Maybe we can do it on the MCU or like, you know, the multiverse or its um, uh, prospects for the future, which we've done a couple of times before, but every time we try and record something, they always release new stuff that makes yeah. it even. It's like, oh, okay, well, I guess that's all out of date now.
I mean, fucking, we were out of date on that Morbius second video out by, <laughs> after like two days. One day. Uh, I still, though, think we've got a chance for um, uh, my idea for how they're going to bring the X-Men in to happen. We've still got a chance for that. 